Thank you. So we're rolling already? Yep. Thank you. Hey, Tom. Hey, how you doing, Jason? All right, mate. Good. Just do something silly for me on the guitar, just real quick. Oh, so let me do that again. Yeah. <sighs> I didn't get it right first go, though. So you are human. Well, some would say. No, I am. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cats and dogs, farm animals, whoever else we can get to pay attention, this is the incomparable Mr. Tom Quayle. Nice to see you. Likewise. My name is Jason McNamara. I guess this one's going to go out on my channel after that build up. <laughs> and uh, I'm sitting here with basically, okay. My love, why the hell did my camera just turn off? Oh, I'll fix that in a second. My love of all things musical basically boils down to I love a practiced musician. That's what it is. And for me, Tom might as well be the ultimate, for, for most dudes out there, the ultimate playboy centerfold in history. That oh is my the, God. Oh. God. Well, I'm not saying you're Guthrie Governor, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking of me being a centerfold. That doesn't work in my head. But but for me to admire a talented musician, dude, I'm stoked. But and you know what? As I said to you a few times over this week, the thing that I like the most is that I can just sit sit down and chat to you like a regular. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, that's what I like. Yeah, I really like that. Cool. Um, now my battery on my camera seems to be dead, so I need to quickly run out and grab my other battery. So okay. while I'm doing that, Tom's going to play some interlude music that I'm going to edit in later. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm certain that was lovely. <laughs> there were too many notes, but it might have been quite There's never places. too many notes, in my opinion, as no. long as they're played well. They were played okay. There you go. Let's get a little bit of history here on okay. who Tom Quayle is, because quite frankly, um, I'd heard of you, but didn't really know much about you. Sure. So, can... Okay, how are we when you start a guitar? Uh, it was 1995, so I was 15 at that point. So 15 going on 16. So you're 40. No, no, no sorry, what are you 37. Now? Now. So, sorry, I just realised it's not 2020 yet. <laughs> I did the math completely wrong there. So no 37 worries. now. Okay, and I'm 45 and I'm not anywhere near your level, but you've dedicated a lot. So yeah. what did you sacrifice growing up to put in this many hours? I mean, not huge amounts, but certainly, like, the, the thing is it wasn't really sacrificed because... It's what you wanted it's, to do. Well, yeah, I know it's a cliche, but literally all my brain was interested in was playing guitar. And it was really exciting because I did the cliched thing where like I get the new Steve Vai record and then I get the tab book and I would consume it. Then I get Guitar Techniques magazine, which is a huge thing in the UK. I don't know if you guys get it in Japan or in Australia, maybe not. I know that one. It's huge in the US as well. And I just used to consume this stuff. And so to me, it didn't feel like sacrificing anything at all. And like, again, you know, you mentioned about kind of social skills and stuff and being able to talk to people. I don't yeah, think yeah. any of that was sacrificed. And also, you know, I can ride a bike, I can cook, I can drive a car and all that business. So I've not really missed out on any particularly important life skills. But I guess I just put hours and hours and hours in between the age of 15 and 19, maybe. Sure. It makes um, sense. That's where most people practice. Yeah, well, this is it. So that's when you've got the most free time and you've got no responsibilities financially or otherwise. If you're young, remember that because it totally disappears as you get older. Oh, my word, does it disappear. I've I think that's our camera now. for this. Oh, angle. is this our camera? Yeah. I've got, I've got two kids and, you know, it's just... It, your time disappears completely. So you do look back with kind of reminiscence and fondness to that time when you, you know had all that free time to actually practice. Totally. I did a jazz degree as well, so that gave me three years to actually sit down and, you know, literally all you're doing is playing and practicing because that's what you're, you know, doing the degree for. 
So you've got the odd essay to write, but you can sit down and just play and play and play. And you're playing with other people who are just as inspired as you. So that was very useful. Is jazz your primary style? It used to be. Not so much anymore. I wouldn't call myself... Like, I could do a jazz gig. Um, no problem. I, I, I read... You know, I play from the real book and read mm -hmm. standards, no problem at all. I know quite a few standards, but my vocabulary on the guitar has changed to way more of a fusion thing. So I don't have as much jazz language as I used to. I used to want to be Pat Metheny. That was my bag. It's funny. My question was about to be if you could have been somebody or like, let's say somebody fell sick and you're like, I want to fill in for him because right. I could walk in and do that gig tonight. It would be Matheny. Would it, it would. I wouldn't be able to walk in and do the gig. No way. But when well, I... it's Matheny. We get that. Exactly. When I was doing the jazz thing in a big way, so when I was doing the jazz degree, he was the guy, initially at least, who I absolutely wanted to sound like because his time feel was amazing. Then it moved on. I wanted to be Kurt Rosenwinkel. I don't know if you know these guys, but... Just all these kind of, you know, hot New York guys. I wanted to, I, that's what I wanted to do. And you quickly realize that they are a little bit like Guthrie in a way. They are the absolute echelon of their field. They're like the Einsteins of the guitar world. That's Guthrie to a Z. Exactly. So you, you end up kind of, okay, well, I'll temper my expectations somewhat. And then I ended up doing the fusion thing because it made, it, it kind of resonated with me more. And my technical approach, which I, I only started doing the legato thing which is kind of what I'm known for. Um, probably about 2004, 2005. Wow, okay. Well, can you give us an example? Yeah, so my playing, I think I played you guys a Ooh. lick. Should have started the GoPro earlier. It's all, right. it's all good. We're going well, now. We didn't miss anything too much, I don't think. I played you guys a lick last night that was like this Pat Metheny. Now, that is a combination of picking and legato, which is how he plays. I have a slow-mo video of him yes, doing that from last night, which I'll insert. There won't be any audio, but uh, you'll be able to see a slow-mo version of that. It's cool. Do you know what? Actually, funny enough, the, this will interest you because you, you like Guthrie. That, I learned that lick from a Guthrie transcription back in, like, 1996. <laughs> how weird is that? Because he transcribed some Matheny. Anyway, that is a combination, if I do it slowly, which you've got the slow-mo footage of already, there's way more picking than I would normally do. So if you watch the right hand, it's like... So even that section there, there's quite a lot of picking, whereas my technique now is literally as little picking as possible. So I'll only pick when I transition. So if I do this slowly... such minimalist picking yeah the right hand this is everyone looks at this hand yeah, this yeah. is the one you want to look at because it agree. doesn't move so if i'm like this is kind of remaining fairly static <laughs> um and that's why you oh get this very God. even sound because if i was picking all of the string transitions with a big downstroke or an upstroke it wouldn't sound even but because I don't move a great deal, then it sounds very even. The problem is, if I have to dig in, that's when things start to go wrong. Because Really? Yeah, because I'm really super relaxed with the right hand. Um, and if I have to start digging in, that's where things are a little bit more kind of... So don't relative. call you if you want to do Gary Moore covers. Yeah, right. So if it's stuff like that where you need the... Oh, I can do it if it's, if it's riff-based or if I'm playing um, kind of like... <laughs> That's, that's fine, but if I had to do it with, then you know, I, I, there's no way. Did you just hybrid peak then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I use the, I use the middle finger, Jason. I shouldn't do that. Today. <laughs> Probably totally out of focus then. Um, yeah, I use the middle finger. That's why the hand doesn't move very much because if you're doing it with a pick, I can't do it. But if I again watch this hand because this yeah, yeah, to watch yeah, this yeah. one, but watch the right hand. If I pick. <laughs> It's a nightmare. First, the timing's wrong. There's big movements. Can you try doing that, doing up down strokes on everything? <sighs> try, please. Yes. Not that fast. We understand though. it. We understand it's not your strong suit, but that's cool. That's the whole point. So if I was to go, that kind of a thing is about as fast as I can go. I can pick, but I can't improvise with it. My control is not there improvisationally. That's interesting. So I can play like, uh, I can pick like that. Right. Which is like, you know, when you're- 15. That's what I, that's all I can do. So you sit down when you're 15 and you learn Paul Gilbert licks and that kind of thing and, and, and John Petrucci licks, so. That stuff I can do, but I can't improvise with it. Whereas the legato thing, like I can take, I'm in the key of G. 
I can sit pretty much and I can I can't talk and play at the same time unfortunately because it'll duck it out on the, yeah, on the video but, but if I could basically we could have a conversation while I was doing this so like this is really super relaxed and hopefully if I play quietly you'll be able to hear my voice I can talk and do this at the same time we can have a conversation and um, that's just muscle me memory for you it's not muscle it, it sort of is muscle memory but it's also the technique is so um, back of the brain sure that you don't have to think about it so this is all I'm not playing the same licks it's, it's, it's sort of the same things over and over again but I can go in any direction I want to because sure. ooh, it's all right. let's not knock he'll survive um, because that's improvisational technique whereas the other one is predetermined technique I can only play things I've learned sure that makes sense yeah and that's why my picking I always say to people my picking sucks and they're like well you can pick but yeah, my picking sucks in my mind because there's no improvisational ability with well, it. Well, nobody's going to be a harsher critic on you than yourself, especially yeah. with everything you've learned. Yeah. I have a thing that I do with my videos all the time, which is I turn to the camera and I tell you guys something that I've taken away from it that I want you to take away from it. And I'm going to throw this in early here because me and Tom have been hanging out and chatting a little bit over the course of this week. Um, the humility is what I want you to take away from a guy like Tom Quayle. Sorry to expose you, but this is kind of my thing in my videos. No, that's cool. Um, the humility is the fact that, like, he's a fuck-off good guitar player. Like, let's just be frank about this. And he's practised his ass off and he's gotten good. Yet, I've seen everybody here, like, everyone from Phil X to Pete Thorne to Robert Baker to absolutely everybody is literally like, we're not worthy, we're not worthy when it comes to Tom Quayle. Um, a lot of people, myself included when I was younger, as soon as you start getting a little bit good, you kind of build up a little bit of an ego, and then as you get older, you realise that you're an idiot, and you're, I'm sure you had the same thing, <laughs> right? It, yeah. We've all been there, but it's yeah, yeah, true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, as you're starting to get a little bit better, just remember there's always somebody better. For Absolutely. Tom, it's probably Guthrie. Well, and for I, I Guthrie, for, it's... I was going to say, what's happening you know, with Guthrie? But yeah, there, for there, Guthrie, it's probably no one. Well, that's the thing, actually, because that's an interesting topic for him, because he's such an all-rounder. There will be somebody... Like, say for instance, Guthrie's doing the solo guitar thing. He's amazing at it. Ridiculous at it. But he probably looks at someone like Tuck Andreas or Tommy Emmanuel. Sure. And in his mind, we, we all know that he's ridiculous. But in his mind, he will have that same humility. And you've met Guthrie loads. I've met Guthrie many times. We know he's as humble as anybody. Oh, he's a totally beautiful humble. guy. And if a guy of that level, that literally comes along once a century, if not less can be that humble then the rest of us should look up to him as an example of how humbleness is probably quite a good virtue to have really Tommy Emmanuel is exactly the same there you go all of the really amazing players with a very few exceptions there will always be exceptions of course but all the guys who's playing talks for itself they don't tell you they're amazing they Steve will always... another one yeah there you go all these guys are like that yeah. because they're playing is the thing that talks and they don't need to tell you how good they are Michael Miniman is exactly the same. I mean, he's a drummer, not a guitarist, obviously, but he's... Well, then he plays he is, I was gonna say, exactly. Yeah, he is a there guitarist too. That's annoying, isn't it? Yeah, that we both know all this crap. Well, no, not just <laughs> that, but the fact that he's an amazing guitar player as well. Oh, it's ridiculous. And a cool writer as well. Yep. I would say songwriter, but I don't know that he necessarily writes songs. He writes pieces of music. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a difference. Yep. And he's such a fun writer. Yeah. He's incredible. So, like, you, you hang out with Marco, and it's just like... If nobody mentioned the word drums, he wouldn't even bring it up. Oh yeah, he's just yeah. there to hang out and be fun and be his little bit taller than me, yeah, funny right. Germans, way skinnier than me, crazy yeah. fun self, and yeah, I love yeah. him for that. Exactly. It's, it's, I think you you do sometimes sort of get the impression that musicians who are really really amazing are going to be egotistical and really horrible, but they really are. Yeah, they really are, and I think that's a good thing to take away. You know. Just if you find yourself having a bit of an ego, just what you said, basically, if you find yourself having a bit of an ego, try and check it as quick as possible because yeah. it's going to give you problems in the future. It really is. You know, like you said, basically you nailed it. You said there's always going to be someone better than you. And if you have that in the back of your mind, you'll probably be able to temper that ego somewhat. Well, hey, I'm not the greatest video director in the world, but I try. And exactly. And I've thing. seen your stuff and it's great. You know, it's really high quality. Thank you. Um, but again, you wouldn't be like, I am the greatest videographer in the whole world and everybody mm. else should, you know, pale into insignificance against me. You know, there's room for everybody to be really good at what they do and, you know, you don't need the ego, so. There's another flip to that as well, which is like some people 
and and Hennig is a perfect example. So we were talking about that last night. Mm-hmm. Some people just give themselves such a hard time. Yeah, they don't right. actually allow themselves to get good. Like I know that, okay, give me some GoPros and my Canon and whatever, and I can make some pretty cool work, but that's because I'm a musician. So I can translate music videos into what we want to see because we're musicians. That's mm-hmm. why I didn't get as good as you are on the guitar. And thankfully when I discovered filming and editing and stuff, I was like, I can kind of bring what I kind of learned how to do on guitar onto this and now I've got a little difference. But I know there's definitely plenty of people who are better at this than me. Yeah. But I just, I at the same time, I feel proud that I can do something. And I guess that's kind of where you would have started at and then you took it to a whole nother extreme again. Yeah, but again, you know, like wherever you get to, you said something else that was really important, which is that I'm always going to be my harshest critic. And I don't think that's a bad thing because I'm always hyper aware of the things I can't do as well as the things I can do. And I think remembering that, you know, you don't have to beat yourself up, but be aware of the things that you can't do, but be okay with that as well, because you can't do, well, I say you can't do everything. We're going to bring him up again. You know, can do everything, <laughs> but, but you know, you, you can't do everything. So you have to concentrate on the things that you are good at. Yep. Be okay with that. If you screw up, People do screw up, you know, like I, the first thing we did, like I never get nervous ever and I wasn't nervous, but just people mess up. So we, you said, do, do something. And I was like, okay, well I'll do this. And it very, very kind of, uh, like a, not a lack of control, but I just, just was like, okay, I've screwed up now. And then you just do it again. And that's fine. People do screw up all the time and you have to be okay with that. It's, it's a normal human trait. That's why I refuse to do wedding videos because you can't afford to screw them oh, up. Oh man, the pressure. I could never, ever deal with that stress. No, thank you. Oh, sorry, I've ruined the best day of your life. <laughs> there's, a, there's a dude who uh, who I follow on uh, YouTube is a filmmaker called Peter McKinnon, Canadian guy. I talk about him a lot because I really enjoy his stuff. And uh, he said, you don't know fear until you shoot a wedding video on film. Oh, I can, oh my. And then he shipped the film from Canada to uh, California somewhere to get it um, exposed and then had to get it shipped back he said you don't know fear until you do that and that would be the scariest thing I could possibly imagine for yeah. anyone I would rather depth for go through than do that no. <laughs> no way so can you tell the folks out there that don't know who you are who you've played with over the years like sessions live I mean you must have a pretty cool resume I imagine. Um, I've played with some cool people so um I guess one of my favourite moments uh, a, couple, a few years ago, um, I played. I did a lot of stuff with Dweezil Zappa, which was pretty cool. With Dweezil, yeah. So, uh, you know, d- done some playing with Dweezil Zappa. Um, I what else have I done? So, By the way, I don't know all of this yet either. I'm learning like you are. Yeah. So, um, I've done done work with um, an amazing bass player in the US called Adam Nitti. He's he's kind of a, a you know an incredible bass What's player. What's his name? Adam again? Nitti. Adam Nitti. Oh, I do know that name. Yeah, really, really great guy. Um, just put an album out actually with some amazing players. So an album called The Elba Triangle, which is a fusion album. You should all go and buy The Elba Triangle. It's a really good album. A-L-B-A? E-L-B-A. Elba. Oh, Elba. Okay. Elba Triangle. Yep. Um, don't ask me why it's called that. Um, well, you're not Adam Nitti. It's not your job to know. Huh? No, no. Well, no, That's this is this is an album that I've put out. So oh, okay. With, with two other guitar players, a guy from Italy called uh, Marco Spogli and another guy from Italy called Al- Alessandro Benvenuti. These guys are amazing. It's a full-on crazy fusion album. We've got um, Virgil Donati played drums on there. Oh, he's okay. Yeah. If you like that sort of thing. A guy called Vengren, Alex Argento played keys on there. Um, Anton David Jantz, who's an insane Russian bass player. Wow. Um, yeah, well, I've done a lot of stuff with a guy that's here at the moment, a guy called Martin Miller as well. Yeah, yeah, the German guy, yeah. just incredible. We've done a Isn't sort of, you know, did a European tour, played in Japan a little bit as well, which was kind of cool. Next time you come out to Japan, you'll have to let me know. Oh, dude, I, I need to come out to Japan again. I loved it. It was amazing. Um, it's pretty cool living in Tokyo. Yeah, I can imagine. You mentioned Virgil just before. He's a funny little side fact. I'm the one... I'm boasting, but it's true. I'm the one that gave Virgil his very first listen to Dream Theater. Really? Because you know how much that influenced everything. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. He he used to play with a band called Southern Sons. Are you familiar with Erwin Thomas and Phil yes. Buckle, the guitar yeah, yeah, players yeah, from course, that band? Yeah, yeah. So, because uh, like as good as Erwin is, Phil Buckle is like open tunings every song and just it's insane and he dropped into the shop in tokyo that i was working at uh, uh, maybe not even a year ago i was like oh my god but anyway so uh back in 92 is when i first heard dream theater images and words album yes and uh, i used to see southern suns all the time they'd come through adelaide my hometown all the time and i was like hey virgil i've got something for you to listen to that i think you're gonna like and i i copied images and words on a cassette for him and I gave him the cassette and he's like, what is this? And I was like, just listen to it. And 
we all know how much that's influenced him since. Like, that was one of that my... Was me. At that it's album, that. everybody who came around to our house when I was 15, so 95, I, was, I got into images and words, everybody had to listen to Under a Glass Moon. It oh. didn't matter why they were there. They might have been like a cleaner or they might have been my brother's violin teacher or they might have been like somebody coming around to walk the dogs. So I was like, no, seriously, listen to this. I've got to ask, do you know how to play that solo? I do. Please. Well, it's, it doesn't work in this tuning. That's the only Well, you can issue. retune quickly. I know, you've just got, you're in fourth. Oh, yeah, well, so thanks for giving me this guitar to play the solo from Under a Glass Moon. <laughs> I didn't, you chose that guitar. So it's been a long time. Uh, so the riff. solo is something like uh, that's about as much as you're getting off the rest of it. It's something like that. Was unbelievable even getting that far. I have a cover on YouTube of that solo. So but the fact that you're to... playing it on a hollow body jazz style guitar with no gain whatsoever yeah, is well, freaking unbelievable. I think one of those, it's interesting actually, um, I have a bit of a mantra in my brain that if somebody gives me a challenge. <laughs> challenge accepted. The thing is, it can be fun. You know, I was saying like it's okay to screw up. Yep. It can be fun to, to do those things and challenge yourself, and it's okay if you screw up because. You just said it, it's like a clean jazz guitar through a clean amplifier exactly. with no gain, nothing, and it's like it's got 11s on it. 11s I'm so tempted to go and grab a shredder guitar and just put yeah, it in your Yeah, yeah, and loads of gain and stuff. <laughs> I mean, and that's so not my technique and stuff as well, it's sure. sort of picking stuff, but there, I, I did learn that all of that album religiously, I learned Awake religiously, everything, every single note when I was sort of 15, 16, so that actually, funny enough, is the only one I do remember how to play. And that I, was better than tits. Well, I, I can I can on a on a day where I've had kind of Four time coffees. to think about it. Yeah, yeah, right. I can play it all the way through, but on this guitar, you get stuck anyway because you need the whammy bar for the kind of Yamaha Yeah, of course, stuff. of course. But, um, yeah, it's a, he was my absolute number one hero, and I've been really, really lucky to get to to get to know him a little bit and kind of hang out with him. And he's he's the classic example of why you should meet your heroes because he's just the nicest guy ever. Really, really cool. Again, super humble. The theme of this video seems to be uh, how humble these guys are. Amazing. Um, and I think next year, um, I'm probably gonna end up teaching at his summer camp as well, so that's gonna be an experience. That's one of those experiences of a lifetime. You're gonna teach at his summer camp? Yeah, that's what we've been planning, so wow. that's kinda cool. Um, so Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Seriously, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Well, this is the cool thing about doing this, um, and you've met loads of your heroes. Oh yeah. Meeting the people who inspired you when you're 15 and ending up doing stuff with them. So again, Dweezil Zappa for me, it's just the coolest thing in the world. It's I like, wonder if you ever met my god. Oh, go on. Gary Moore. No, I didn't. Oh, Gary was... Never. I, I listened to a, a student of mine got me into the Coliseum stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, just after he died. Right. Because I... I just didn't have a Gary Moore face for no other reason than that I was listening to other people and it just never fitted in. You There's know, heaps never... of other guitar players I've missed out on too. This over is the it. Years, everybody, is. everybody does. So I never had my Gary Moore face. But when the, this, this student of mine played me some Coliseum, I, was, I had no idea he could play like that. Mm. Because I thought he was a, just, a, I don't mean just, but like a blues rock guy. Yep. But he's this crazy kind of fusion He can play jazz. Fusion kind fusion, of playing. Yeah. Unbelievable. I've seen a video on YouTube of him sitting down with a 335, and I was like, oh, this will be interesting. And he was just not even the Gary Moore that I grew up worshipping. It was like a whole other guitar player. There was so much more to his playing than I think a lot of guitar players who've not really looked into his playing, yeah. myself included, just never realised. Album credits. So... Pop artist, fusion artist, crazy avant-garde. We haven't sort of finished all of that yet. So, like, let's say household names. Who may you have possibly played with? Oh, over the years? household names. I mean, my session stuff is not. I don't do like pop records or anything like that. It's okay. not something that I've ever broken into. And the part part of the reason for that is, this tuning, is not compatible with that kind of thing. In fact, that's a slight lie, 
because um, there's a guitar player in the UK called Alex Hutchins who also plays in this tuning. We've had many discussions about basically this tuning makes you unemployable for anybody except yourself. <laughs> because the guitar is really, really set up around standard tuning. And if you play all sorts of repertoire, you've got all sorts of riffs that are classic guitar riffs, all the songs we know and love, they require those top two strings to be a B and an E. Of course. And I don't do that. We haven't mentioned it yet, but I play a C and an F as my top two strings. And I can't play in standard tuning, which is why when you said the Under a Glass Moon thing, I was like, oh man, I have to go into standard tuning now. And I only know that solo as shapes on the guitar. Muscle memory, yeah. Muscle memory. Whereas everything else I play, I know exactly what I'm playing. And to give you an example, I did, um, I do a lot of um, fairly high-end Jewish material in the UK with a company called Lig Library. Mm -hmm. And I did a Steely Dan DVD and I was teaching seven Steely Dan tunes. It was like a huge, huge project. And I had to learn all of it in standard tuning because you have to play it in standard tuning. You can't play it in fourths. Which well, of course, because the students will be screwed. Well, no, not just that, but you can't play it in fourths. Oh, Physically is impossible. The open E's and yeah, D's exactly. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So much. Like you take, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the tune now. Um, reeling in the ears. Exactly, reeling in the ears. That funny. How did you do that? I have gifts. That's, that's There's a potluck guess. <laughs> well, no, reeling in the ears because the riff, some of the riffs in there use pull offs to the other Correct. E and the other That's v. kind of. Okay. okay. So there's one example um, a tune like My Old School, which was Skunk Baxter. All those rhythm parts require standard tuning. And so if you are in the scenario where you play in fourths and you only know the fretboard in fourths and then you have to play all this stuff in standard tuning. It's like schizophrenic guitar brain, it just doesn't work. So that was 10 times more work for me than it would have been if I played in standard tuning. So I've kind of avoided all that stuff, avoided all that work because right. I, it's just a nightmare for me. I just don't play in standard tuning at all. So it's a nightmare trying to do any of that kind of pop repertoire. That So how many Tom Quayle albums exist? Uh, only the Elba Triangle at the moment. Okay. My album is in the process of being my debut album is in the process of being recorded at the moment. Nice. And it, we've got a really nice lineup, um, sort of similar lineup to the Elba Triangle. But um, yeah, that's, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it was nearly done, but it's getting there. Um, people have been waiting a very long time for it. I keep getting emails from people, where is it? When is it? When's it coming out? Where is it? Oh, that's all right. But I have a, as I said before, I have a 13 month old daughter and a 17 year old daughter. So 17 and 13 months. Yeah. That's a bit of a gap. Yep, tell me about it. So wow. they keep me on my toes and I don't have that much time. And I do loads and loads of um, review and demo work. I work for a guitar magazine in the UK and I do a lot of tuition material as well. So trying to find time for my stuff is quite difficult. So uh, that's actually, that's interesting because this is a YouTubers conference that we're here at for GitCon. So your 47,000 odd subscribers is not necessarily indicative of your fan base because you're on other platforms working for other people too, oh, not yeah, just absolutely. for yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So your channel is called Tom Quayle, is it? Well, the actual, back in the day, when we all first started YouTube channels in 2006, nobody knew who I was, so I just picked TQ105. I never okay. thought I would upload anything. And YouTube did a while ago allow you to change your URL, so I changed the URL to Tom Quayle, but people still know it as TQ105. Right. But you can search Tom Quayle and you'll find, find the YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have hugely more video content than, is, than what's on YouTube. Yeah, obviously. An enormously you know, larger catalogue of videos than, I think I have um, coming on for 20 tuition DVDs available. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Plus all my own stuff that I release as well. I've got 26, I think, um, products available on my website. So I've produced masses of all, all mostly fusion and jazz content. So um, when, if ever, was the last time you had a Joe job, like a regular guy kind of job? Probably 2004. Six probably, and you're making a full time living just out of purely being a musician and yeah, teacher. Yeah, one hundred percent. Good on I you. I don't do any individual private tuition at all. Right. I very, very rarely do individual private tuition. So it's all uh, basically products that I sell online and um, any other musician style work that that you know comes along every now and again. I do clinic tours for Laney. Um, you know, for tune the fourths. Tune of, well, that's great because I can do my own stuff. I play my own tunes, so that's not a problem. Um, but I, the session thing and pop, I've done session stuff for fusion guys, yep. but pop records just is not something I would ever try and break into because it's a nightmare. But what, the reason I said earlier, it's kind of a lie is because a very good friend of mine, do you know Alex Hutchins? I know his name. You know I can't picture his face right now. Okay. I do definitely know his name. He's just started <coughs> playing with Steve Wilson 
Oh, really? Now, he also is a British guy. One of the, there's, there's two or three of us, in fact, three of us that, that I know of who tune this way. But he started playing with Steve Wilson. So you can do, it's not a pop gig, but you can do that kind of thing and be in this tuning. But, if, but Steve Wilson is quite different to a standard pop gig. Oh, yeah. So I'm a huge Porcupine Tree fan. Well, of course, Guthrie did that gig before. Now, he yeah. plays in standard, in standard tuning, obviously. But um, Yeah, you but know. you could tell Guthrie to tune the guitar to all well, sorts of crap and he'll still do it. He probably right. does, you know, just to give himself a challenge. But, but you know, it, you can do that kind of thing, but I've never seen anybody tune this way doing a standard pop gig. Sure. You know, the John May thing or playing for Jennifer Lopez or playing for whoever you know it doesn't matter just they all tune standard it's an interesting collection of choices John Mayer and Jennifer Lopez actually oh. were they a couple I don't know I didn't really keep up with that I was crap. just going for the J's J the letter J in the alphabet okay that makes sense <laughs> and you could have gone for me but I'm not a pop artist so it doesn't matter well there we go <laughs> there we go um, all right, well, listen, I, I think we should probably just call it quits here because this doesn't need to be a ridiculously long video, but it's cool. been great sitting down having a yeah, chat. Yeah, dude, it's great. Good stuff. It's fun watching how everyone just freaks out over you like you're the hot chick in the room and you're just like, yeah, hey, listen, it's great to be here and, and I, I love the humility. I keep going on about it, but I really do dig it because cool. not everyone has that. That's good to know. Can you play us something out, whatever it chooses to be? Yeah. And, and, and because the Japanese and the Aussies too, I mean, I get audiences. I don't really know where my audience is based that well. I don't check my stuff as much as I should. But generally, my audience likes a bit of crazy shit. So please don't just be all polite and gentle, but you can do that too. Oh, I'm not in, I'm in standard tuning. Oh. It's like, why does this sound weird? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've been Jason McNamara, this has been Tom Quayle, we're at GitCon, the inaugural 2017, and by the way, they've announced that next year there's going to be a GitCon 2018. Yes. One week later, just into October. Very exciting. Awesome. Nice to speak to you, Jason. Likewise, mate. I hope to see you in Japan before GitCon. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Cheers, dude. Rock on! Rock on!